very engaged in environmental stuff. And in one of our first meetings, uh, and, and you know, this was quite restricted work, he brought in a young student and said, uh, by the way, uh, would you like that we include uh, Arnold Gerard in uh, our project? And how, how he was, well, this was actually not an offer we could refuse. Um, because uh, of the, the, let's say, the status of this professor. And then the professor became executive director of the European Environmental Agency in Copenhagen and was out, uh, and we were left with Anna. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is uh, uh, actually proved to uh, be uh, very fortunate, not that uh, there was anything wrong with Hans Breinings, but uh, Arnold has, uh, I would say, uh, without blushing on his behalf, has developed into the leading governance researchers um, in uh, in this in sports governance researcher, um, and we are very very happy about that cooperation. And uh, Arnold also received acknowledgement from his colleagues in the group yesterday because. Uh, Arnold has been the driver of developing the methodology that we are using in the National Sports Governance uh, Observer. And um, Arnold will now uh, tell, I don't think, I don't know, Arnold, but you will not repeat all the uh, things about the methodology that you said this morning, uh, but many of the considerations are, of course, exactly uh, the same. But uh, we will now hear what uh, the research carried out uh, by Arnold and by the researchers in um, in uh, eight European, sorry, nine European countries and Brazil, uh, what that, that has uh, revealed. And that's okay. <clears throat> thank you, Jens, for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you all for uh, sticking with us. Uh, kind of proud uh, to stand here now uh, this afternoon to unveil the work that we have been doing. This is not my work, this is the work of 10 uh, research partners uh, supported by Play the Game. Uh, so I'm very proud to be able to stand here also on behalf of uh, the research partners. In the morning we talked about good governance in international federations. Now we will talk about good governance in national federations, or in the case of Belgium, it's a complicated country, sub-national uh, federations, Flemish uh, sport federations. I will talk about the National Sports Governance Observer Project. I will explain who was involved, why we did what we did, and what is it that we have been doing the past two years with uh, your taxpayer money. Then I will go a little bit into methodological choices, basically repeating what I said this morning to show you how we measured uh, good governance in national sports federations. I will walk you through some of the results. There are 10 research partners, there are a lot of results. It's sometimes difficult to draw lines between all these uh, national reports. I will try to do it, but I will mainly show you some key figures and then leave it up to you and really invite you to uh, look into our report to see um, the results in detail. And then I will draw some general conclusions. Yes, my ears are too small. Right, NSGO project, who, why, what? Let's start with who. Who are we? We are a consortium of researchers, research institutions, seven full project partners, three voluntary partners. We receive funding from the European Union Erasmus Plus program and also, as Jens mentioned uh, this morning, subsidies from the Danish Parliament. The coordinator, uh, very important to stress this, the very competent coordinator was Play the Game Danish Institute for Sports Studies. We were fortunate enough to have um, some very nice associated partners among which EPAS, European Partial Agreement from Sport, and you have met uh, Stanislas Fossar uh, earlier. Also, XPE, International Council of Sports Science Physical Education. Uh, EASM, European Association for Sports Management, uh, and a few sport organizations as well, which was very helpful for our research. That's who we are. 
Why did we look into good governance in national sport federations? May seem self-evident. I think it's important to stress a few uh, points here. Uh, even though we, we notice, uh, and we really noticed this while doing our research, that good governance is uh, something that a lot of people in the sports world are talking about. And very few federations today, nationally or internationally, would deny its importance. So very few federations would tell you we don't care about good governance. Everybody kind of realizes that, that it is important. That doesn't mean that it is uh, easy to define, measure, and implement. Actually, it's very difficult to define what good governance is. It's a buzzword. I heard this morning it is a buzzword. And this is how it goes with buzzwords. Everybody's talking about it, but nobody really knows what it means. Difficult to define. If it's difficult to define, it's also difficult to measure, of course. What are you supposed to measure? What is good governance all about? If it's difficult to measure, it's also difficult to implement. How can we expect national sport federations to know what principles they should implement? So, there is no common un understanding of governance, what that means, and its abstract components, transparency, accountability, what does that mean, democracy, very, very vague, broad concepts. And therefore, what we see quite often, and I realized that while doing uh, research on good governance in Flemish sports federations before I entered into this project, that there is a gap between discourse and practice and between expectations and reality. So again, very few sports federations today would deny the importance of good governance. And they often say, yes, good governance is important, and yes, we are implementing it. And then as soon as you start digging into the organization, quite often you see a particular deficits. Uh, so there is really sometimes a gap between discourse and practice. Also between expectations and reality, we expect them to adhere to uh, principles of good governance. Many countries, they think, our, our uh, federations are run in a decent manner. Reality is sometimes quite different. So I think, on the one hand, sport federations, they really need to understand what principles must be implemented, how and why. We met many Sport federations in the course of our project were very eager to implement good governance but didn't know how to do it. What actually constitutes good governance? We have to help them. We also need to help public actors, stakeholders and researchers. Because quite often, as I told you this morning, you need some external pressure to put on sport federations in order to push them a little bit gently but uh, decisively into the direction of good governance. So, Public actors, stakeholders, researchers, they need reliable and valid monitoring tools to effectively signal and then subsequently address weaknesses. That's why we did what we did. Now, what is it that we did? Our main aim was to assist sport federations and to inspire them to raise the quality of their governance practices. So this may sound uh, like a very vague sentence and a, an empty sentence, but I think it is very important because it actually defined our approach. We didn't go to the sport federations to point fingers and to tell them you are doing very badly. We went to them with an open mind, constructive attitude, and we tried to involve them in the research. We tried to tell them, listen, we understand you do not necessarily implement all these principles, you do not have to implement all these principles, let us do a benchmarking. Perhaps we can identify gaps that are interesting for you to address them. That was our philosophy, our approach during the entire project. Um, and I think that was much appreciated by the federations and really contributed to them supporting our research uh, on, in a general uh, extent. So we wanted to measure to assist them, we wanted to measure governance. We also wanted to help them a little bit by building capacity. So what we did was we developed and applied indicators of good governance in order to be able to measure them. And we produced reports on the status quo. Our main report is here on this table. If you don't have a copy already, I would advise you to take one. Um, in the reports, we give concrete recommendations. We try to inspire uh, governmental actors, but also sport organizations to raise the quality of their standards. We also expected our partners to build networks. They shouldn't uh, just sit on their desks doing the research. They had to try to make a connection with the sports sector and if possible also with governmental actors. 
it is important that you establish these networks in order to be able to advise people and that they can come back to you. For that purpose, we organized national training workshops. I've been very fortunate to, to go to uh, a lot of these uh, national seminars, and I can tell you that overall the impact of these seminars has been positive. There is a discussion now in these countries to various extents, but nonetheless, there is a discussion in the 10 countries that participated on good governance, and I think that's uh, really uh, the main outcome of this project. We also, had, of course, played a game conference where we had significant attention for good governance. Right, so what do we have right now? We have our report. This is the report. You can find it here. Again, you can download it online. National Sports Governance Observer. National Sports Governance Observer, much like the tool I explained this morning, is a benchmarking tool for good governance, not in international federations, but obviously in national and subnational sport federations. Nine European countries were included in the research. Uh, we will focus on those countries. Cyprus, Denmark, Flanders, Germany, the Netherlands, Norway, Poland, Romania. And we agreed that we would all review at least eight federations. And we said, well, at least you review the federations responsible for administrating handball, swimming, athletics, football, and tennis. And for the other federations, you're more free. You can uh, focus on interesting cases. Make sure that your sample is balanced, that you have large, mid-sized, small federations, that you have a good sample, a nice, interesting sample to work with. So that's what we asked our partners uh, to do. How did we do it? Very briefly, it is important to stress it a little bit. Uh, what is good governance? Again, we define it on the basis of the academic literature. Uh, we define it uh, by splitting it up into four dimensions, transparency, reporting on your internal workings, allowing others to monitor you, democracy, having competitive free and fair elections, involving your stakeholders in your internal policy processes, and having open internal debates in your organization. Accountability, again, uh, a separation of powers, making sure that no single entity or single person has complete control over the organization, on the one hand. On the other hand, having rules of conduct for dealing with finances, for dealing with ethical issues, with dealing with uh, conflicts of interest, and so on. And also making sure that if somebody violates these norms, internal organizational norms, that there are repercussions. And finally, societal responsibility. Again, employing the potential that you have as a sports federation to have a positive impact on your stakeholders, but also at society at large. And it's about doping, it's about anti-match fixing policies, it's about anti-sexual harassment policies, it's about environmental sustainability policies, and so on. So four dimensions of good governance, those were the basis of our <coughs> measurement. Why implement those? Stressed this already this morning. I'm showing you this just to tell you that we, we selected our indicators and the principles of good governance on the basis of theoretically that they would be able to have a positive impact. So we really tried not to select um, principles, indicators, that would not have a positive impact in theory. So they had to follow um, the idea of the theoretical framework that we used as a criterion for good governance. I think that's important because most federations implement good governance simply because, well, they see other federations implementing it, they don't think about it, and they just take it and implement it in their organization. You need to think about these things. Are they really helping my organization? If they're not helping you, don't implement them. Okay. Um, what we did here uh, is, again, this is the same basically as this morning. We have four dimensions, transparency, democracy, accountability, societal responsibility. On the basis of best practices and the academic literature, uh, we selected as a group 46 principles, broad principles of good governance from which we thought these are uh, the most important ones that they should implement. And in order to measure them, again, same as this morning, we used simple yes or no indicators. Uh, for the international one, we have 309. Uh, for the national one, we have 274. And the reason is that we can expect international federations to adhere to kind of a higher standard of good governance than national sport federations who have limited or more limited administrative capacity, uh, different risks, 
uh, and so on, different responsibilities. Again, I want to stress it again, uh, the other value of this approach is that we use a strict standard, we don't rely on self-assessment, we are the ones doing the research, it's easy to use, it's yes or no, so people, and we really invite people to use the tool now, it's freely available, it's simple yes or no questions, it is holistic, 274, that's a lot, some people complain about it, oh, it's so much, yeah, it takes some time to implement it, and to, uh, believe me, it takes some time to implement it. Um, but in the end, it gives you a very broad and holistic perspective on good governance, and I think it's worthwhile uh, to use that many indicators. And again, same system here, easy to interpret, traffic light scoring system, I will not explain that uh, in detail um, any further than I already did. This is how it works. Don't, don't be afraid, I will go into this a little more in detail, it's just to give you the broad overview. These are the results of our scores. We have all the countries uh, here, we have the principal scores here, we have the dimensions here, and already you can see a very nice uh, abstract painting, uh, you could say. Uh, for some countries, this abstract painting is very green, for others, it is more uh, red. I'm not pointing any fingers yet. I will do that in the later slide. Okay. So that's the main way that we, we display our results. Again, why? Because it's very easy. You immediately you see where the deficits are. If you want to know more about which criteria the federations implement, you can go to the, to the report. These are the country averages. And you can also take a look at the individual indicators to really know okay, what is it that they are implementing precisely. But this gives you a broad overview and instantly you get a sense of what, where are the deficits uh, in um, our country. Next to that, we also use these, uh, and again, you saw this uh, this morning already, we, we, use, we use these, I think it is called donut charts. Um, basically, we provide dashboards that give you a very clear uh, first glance of where the deficits in general are, where the strengths are in general, and I'm showing you the example of Flanders, I will not go into detail on your scores, but um, you could say here for Flanders, 54, that's an average score, transparency, that's good, uh, democracy, internal accountability, societal responsibility, that's average. Most countries are underperforming, uh, or performing less good than they are, a few countries are performing better. Let's take a look at these countries and uh, let's see what they are implementing and what not. So I broke this down a little bit better so that you uh, would be able to actually read uh, what is on here. I think you can read it. Um, and this shows you instantly that there are some general um, conclusions that you can draw from our analysis. Again, these are all the countries, country averages. And these are then the principles. If you take a look at the transparency dimension, you see that most federations that we reviewed publish their statutes and their internal regulations. Most federations do not publish uh, remuneration reports, for instance, and the picture is uh, more mixed with regard to the other uh, principles. With regard to democracy, one of the strengths, the obvious strengths here is uh, that the election of board members actually takes place, board members are elected. Um, what is lacking is that uh, very few federations have a policy for ensuring that their boards are differentiated so that you have different skills on your board, not only people from sports, nothing against people from the sports world, huh, to be clear, but you also need people with different competences you need people with different backgrounds, perhaps at, um, perhaps uh, different gender backgrounds, uh, different cultural, ethnic backgrounds. Um, those policies are not really in place. Nomination committees, they don't really have them as well. Term limits was an all, another problem that we uh, established uh, only in, uh, um, in, let me see, Flanders, for instance, here in the Netherlands, um, you have a decent term limits. An overall conclusion that you can also draw is that the participation of different stakeholder groups, athletes, referees, coaches, volunteers, and employees, the people that are actually working in the organization, that these stakeholder groups are not sufficiently um, represented. So sometimes there is an athletes committee, 
Most of the times, with regard to that needs, athletes are not involved in uh, multi-annual policy processes, for instance. So when the multi-annual policy is drawn up, athletes are not really consulted, um, let alone referees, coaches, volunteers. Internal accountability, again, picture is quite mixed here. Um, let's take one, for instance, code of conduct, very mixed pictures. Uh, in some countries, codes of conduct are implemented, but uh, the quality of these codes of conduct is not sufficiently high. Other countries uh, actually implement good codes of conduct. Uh, maybe what's another one we can take a look at. Most of the federations we reviewed had a clear governance structure. I think that's, that's, that's very important. And maybe in international federations, you don't see that too often. So there, I think national, before, uh, national federations are outperforming international ones. This is, I think, the most problematical dimension of societal responsibility dimension. Again, I think uh, the majority of the federations that we review, they have anti-doping policies. Um, Anti-match fixing policies is already less. Uh, environmental sustainability policies, that's a big problem. And then a mixed picture with regard to the uh, other principles that we reviewed. I invite you again to take a closer look at these and, and look into these course for yourselves. There is so much that I simply cannot discuss everything. It's just to give you a broad overview. To make this overview even broader, let's take a look at uh, the country scores here. As you could perhaps already see a little bit from uh, the previous slides, you see that certain countries, particular countries, or federations rather, in particular countries, are outperforming all the uh, federations in other countries. I'm talking about federations specifically in Norway. It's really striking that, I mean, we really didn't look at Norwegian federations in order to draw up our indicators. We drew up our indicators not knowing that Norwegian federations would simply implement all these things, but basically they do. So Norwegian federations, 78%, that's an astonishingly high score, I think. Um, Denmark is really doing well as well. And the Netherlands also receiving a good score. Then you have Flanders, uh, a little bit behind there. Flanders, they have implemented a good governance code, so they are making steady progress now. And I think quite soon they will catch up on the Netherlands. Uh, so, Frank, keep an eye on that. With regard to the other countries, the, the picture is, is, I think, less positive. Romania, okay, 44%, you could say that's still decent. Uh, a few countries are really lagging behind. Cyprus, Poland. Uh, Brazil, Montenegro, a lot of work needs to be done here. Not to point any fingers too much, uh, Cyprus achieves the lowest score. On a positive note, we actually regard Cyprus as uh, a best practice example of how our instrument can contribute and inform governance policies. After uh, the review had taken place of the Cyprus Sports Federations by Christos, uh, sitting here in the audience, a policy was implemented, a good governance code was drawn up by Christos, who did uh, the research here, and he could draw from the research that he did within the framework of our project. I think that's very important. It's not bad that you achieve bad scores. What is bad is that you don't do anything with it. Uh, so kudos to the people in Cyprus for uh, tackling the problem of uh, good governance. Poland has also uh, been very much involved in trying to establish a code for good governance and coming up with policies that's still uh, in the process. The same picture basically unfolds when you take a look at uh, the different dimensions. And there it is again striking that countries achieve the lowest scores with regard to societal responsibility dimension. And what you could say is that in a number of countries, these things doping policies, sexual harassment policies, environmental sustainability policies, athletes' rights, and so on, they are not regarded as the core business of a sport federation. And they think, well, sport federations, they should run the sport, and not necessarily be involved in these issues. Whereas other countries, particularly, I think Norway and the Netherlands, and also Denmark, I shouldn't include Denmark, these three countries, their sports federations realize, okay, this is part of our core 
operation. It is important to be societally responsible and have a positive impact on stakeholders and society at large, not only running our sport. Yeah, then an interesting question that we were wondering. Um, do we see differences between the different types of federations? So for instance, do, do the football federations, all the football federations in, in, in the nine European countries that we reviewed, do they achieve higher scores than, than um, the handball federations, for instance? So we compared all the federations from one type, and again, we reviewed, everybody reviewed the five same types of federations, all the partners, so we could do that. We had here five federations, and it's striking that the difference is not that large. Okay, you could say football federations are implementing more societal responsibility uh, programs. That's a little bit striking. But for the rest, I don't think that these differences are all that significant. So, federation type, whether you're talking about a football federation, a handball federation, that's not a very good predictor of good governance. What is a good predictor is the country in which the federation is based. That depends, and that determines uh, the level of good governance, not the federation types. General conclusions. I think it is important, again, to, to stress, uh, and I didn't do this uh, this morning, but it, I think it's important to stress what we did abundantly, I think, uh, the benefits of our tool, but also be very honest about what, what we cannot do and what we do not aim to do. I think what we do not aim to do is give a definitive set of good governance principles. I mean, these principles of good governance, they evolve. We have a set of good governance principles. It will evolve in three, four years' time. Maybe we have a different set. So it's never a definitive measurement of good governance. Uh, it's not a direct measurement of effectiveness, legitimacy, and ethical conduct. It's not because you achieve low scores that you are corrupt. That's important. And this is not a blueprint that federations can implement as such. So we're not going to federations and tell them, implement these 274 indicators and you're fine. No, no, no. They're, they're a starting point for discussions and then you can improve it. So again, it's a holistic overview of strengths and weaknesses. It's reliable, we think. It's clear. Uh, it's objective, but it's a starting point for discussions on good governance. It is not an end point. And my final slide, to make this a little more clear, how should you use this? I think it is the starting point, an inventory of the status quo. If you want to implement good governance policies in a country, or as a sports confederation, you want to improve the governance of the federations that you house, first of all, you need to measure good governance. You can use this tool to do it. Then you need to involve the federations in discussions. Then, subsequently, you can implement a code. And then you need both a supporting policy, very important. You will have a lot of federations willing to implement good governance, but not able, because they don't know how to do it. So you need to support them. But finally, you also need an enforcement policy. You need to set minimum standards. And if you don't enforce minimum standards of good governance, you will never achieve uh, universal implementation of good governance. The final word final sentence is for all the project partners. I have been so fortunate to be able to work with you, everybody uh, always delivered. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm very grateful. Thank you as well to the Play the Game staff. I'm sorry for finishing the report rather late. <laughs> you are very good at formatting these things uh, in a very short period of time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna, for this colorful presentation. Um, we are a little short on time, but I think we could uh, have a few, if you have questions for the understanding of uh, what you just, just heard. Uh, yes. Hi, my name is Jorge Leiva from the Institute of National Development Organizations in Bonn. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, what quite well, not to point any fingers, but what about Germany? Uh, you didn't mention it, you didn't talk about it, but it was uh, scoring rather next to Brazil and Cyprus, and with the amount of government funding and uh, you know events and everything that happens in Germany, it's a little bit. Uh, I proud. To be to be very honest, that was a that was a big surprise to us to see that. Uh, we did not expect 
Germany to perform so poorly in the area of good governance. Having shown the research results <coughs> to uh, some people within the Ministry of Sports in Germany, they were also quite surprised. Perhaps they will, they will undertake action. But for explanations behind these weak scores, I will kindly refer you to uh, our German researchers. They're sitting here in the room, and they're, uh, I think, very happy to, uh, to give more clear answers than I am able to. Hey, good morning, Jordi from Cantar Sports. Uh, were you able to draw any relationship with the national sports law and the governance practices? Uh, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. I'm going to be very brief uh, because we can talk about half an hour about that. We have different sports systems. And, and you could say, well, maybe in countries, <coughs> uh, the sports organizations, sports federations are controlled very much by government. I could say that, well, yeah, that you would expect to see better governance, and that's not necessarily the case. For instance, in the case of the Netherlands, where it is basically self-regulation, you see that they achieve pretty high scores, so it doesn't really matter um, which uh, sports system that you implement and whether or not you have a sports law. In Flanders, for instance, you see that the sports federations, they implement what they have to implement, and there are a lot of rules. And they implement these rules, but they rarely go beyond these mandatory rules. In the Netherlands, there are some mandatory requirements, but federations take matters more in their own hands. And what was, what was the most, most important conclusion for me, uh, for witnessing this, is that we can learn from each other's approaches. There are strengths in the Flemish approach. There are strengths in the Dutch approach. There are weaknesses in the Flemish approach. There are weaknesses in the Dutch approach. By bringing these actors together, we can really learn about these things. <coughs> Hi, Marina Schweitzer from National Public Radio in Germany. Um, this morning you talked about um, the federations cooperating more or less, like you pointed out FINA, for example. Uh, now you said that you talked to them and cooperated with them. So does it mean on a national level they all cooperated? Um, so we, in, in a report you can read how many federations that, that cooperated per country. On average, the large majority of the federations, they cooperated. And it was striking, because as you said, Jens, we expected some resistance. I mean, I, I wouldn't be too happy being an organization, working in an organization, all of a sudden a bunch of researchers from a different country, uh, they come and they are going to audit you. But they were quite friendly, and I think what helped was our friendly and engaging approach. <laughs> and if necessary, some pressure. We said, if you will not cooperate, we will do it anyway. <laughs> so it's actually to their benefit that they cooperate. But overall, they were friendly. Some countries, a little less friendly. Thank you, Herman Ram, Dublin Authority in the Netherlands. Um, do you think this project could be adjusted to work for national anti-doping organizations? And if so, would you be interested in doing such a project? <laughs> <laughs> if only we had the funding through an Erasmus Plus project, uh, we would be able to do it. Yeah, we will start doing exactly that uh, in, uh, in February. Uh, so we have, uh, Jens, you can say a little bit more about it maybe? Well, that was actually the cliffhanger for the end of the second half. <laughs> so, spoiler alert, uh, we, we are going to make this and we would very much like to cooperate with you and we can uh, uh, approach Christina, uh, whom you know very well. Uh, we'll uh, coordinate the project and, and let's get, if there are other anti-doping authorities present, let's get, uh, see how we can do to uh, connect. Okay. Because we are very happy to, to the extent that it's practically possible, <coughs> to, like we have done with this project, to not just restrict it to those who were in the application, but uh, to have a wider cooperation. And may I add? Yeah, I think I, I would say uh, thank you to Anand uh, now. Um, you will be around also if there are questions uh, later in the panels. Um, but now I will just, just to, so we can see a little bit more into some of the countries. We thought it would be too much of a marathon if we ran through all the results from all the countries. But we have selected four different uh, types of results. So I kindly ask uh, uh, the representatives of uh, Romania, Germany, Montenegro, and uh, Norway, 
uh, to come. And I have to apologize to Montenegro that uh, Arnold's counting was not fantastic with regard to the number of countries because it said nine countries, but there were actually only eight listed. I hope you are counting in the other areas, it's more precise. Uh, but Montenegro uh, was, uh, was not uh, on the list, and that's because we were, actually, I think technically it's because it was not technically part of the EU finance project, but never mind. Uh, also, I would say with regard to the question about legislation, that each of the national chapters in the thick report you have in your hand gives a brief overview over the uh, legislative uh, framework and ways of funding uh, the organizations. Um, it's, it's pretty dry and dull, but it's uh, fact-based. Um, yes, and um, um, the first uh, uh, speaker is uh, Florian Petrika, who, with whom we have uh, worked on previous occasions uh, and noted that even if he is actually a journalist and TV presenter, he also do uh, proper uh, statistical counting. Uh, it was part of our international sports press survey that we made uh, years ago. And um, we are very, very happy that we could find Romanian partners uh, for this uh, project because uh, we have a tendency not only to be Eurocentric, but also to be Northwestern Eurocentric, whatever that is, where, what the expression is. And uh, Florian, uh, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Florian Petrica from the Faculty of Journalism, University of Bucharest, uh, Romania. It's a great pleasure and honor for being here in front of you today. I have, um, uh, as you said, a short presentation about uh, Romania and its geo um, uh, results. We had um, nine federations in our uh, sample, a very well-balanced um, sample, as we had uh, three large federations, athletics, basketball and football, and one small federation, which uh, was Triathlon uh, Federation. And um, the investigation started in 2017 and ended uh, in um, 2017 in May and ended in November the same, um, the same year. Romania's overall NSGO index score is 44%. Uh, by dimensions, um, they are 47, 45, 52, and 33. Mm, the best score was uh, registered on the internal accountability at uh, 52%. Uh, the low score was uh, at uh, societal responsibility uh, with uh, 33. The big question is why only uh, 44? Uh, why only 44? for Romania on transparency, um, we can see that um, the Romanian Gymnastic Federation <coughs> performed best with 68%, um, uh, also a very nice surprise for the Romanian Gymnastic Federation, 65% is a good surprise because I already told that um, this is the, the smallest federation in the sample. Uh, the athletics was uh, the last with 25% um, and uh, I will focus on the weaknesses because they are just a part of our um, main um, uh, findings. And I will say that no federation included um, uh, risk exploration in their annual reports <coughs> and also no statement regarding conflict um, of uh, interests. On democracy, um, as we uh, can see, we have on the first two places, first two positions, uh, the Romanian Football Federation and the um, uh, Gymnastics uh, Federation. Uh, it's time to say that these two federations, both of them, scored an overall index and NGO over 50%. Uh, the Romanian Athletic Federation is um, again on the last um, uh, position, and um, the explanations um, uh, are here. Um, all federation would have a priority in setting term limits for um, the members of the uh, of the board. Anyway, they should do also in um, provide punctual provisions with regard to, uh, at stakeholders' participation in uh, the organization's um, uh, policy, as you can see here. On accountability now, 
Um, regarding uh, this dimension, the Sweden Federation is the first one with 77 uh, percent, maybe because their status is inspired by the, the FINA chart. So that could be an explanation, but maybe we'll talk more about uh, uh, about this issue because um, this uh, very important score is the best in our in our research. Anyway, there is also a best surprise regarding the tennis uh, Romanian Federation because this will be lost uh, with uh, 27 uh, percent. And I'm saying this is not a good thing because everybody in the world, when is thinking about tennis, thinking automatically about Simona Halep, she's um, W WTA leader uh, at uh, this uh, moment. Okay, all federations have <coughs> the procedures that allow the General Assembly to supervise the board, but at the same time the governance structure is clear, as so all the key position in the board and not only are very well defined. Okay, this is the good, uh, the good there, there are uh, more, but we'll speak, um, I say we'll speak only about the witnesses. Uh, less than half of the federations uh, had a code of conduct applicable for the members of the board, for the other members of the uh, organization. And when we have this code of conduct, we will say that um, this code will need punctual provisions with um, regard on gifts, conflict of interest, expenses, in the case of uh, the, uh, the members uh, of, the, of the board. Then on uh, societal uh, responsibility, where uh, all federations support uh, the worst, we can see the Football Romanian Federation in the first place. This is, um, I might say that this is not a surprise here because we know very well the Football Romanian Federation has very strong and good relations with the FIFA programs inspired in uh, this kind of uh, projects. And, I'm speaking about the societal uh, responsibility, but uh, the athletic score again uh, very bad with only 5%. Uh, there are a lot of things to do because there are a lot of um, problems regarding this uh, dimension. The football, uh, the football Romanian Federation, the gymnastic Romanian Federation scored uh, well, but the football federation is uh, the best, uh, as I said. Anyway, the football federation is very different to, to the Romanian football league. We will discuss a lot about this. Um, I'll say one single thing about um, about uh, this uh, dimension. All federations should do more to have specific action meant to improve the situation of the marginalized communities to sport in uh, Romania. And short. Um, uh, short uh, con conclusions about uh, the report. Um, I'll be very short again, trying to be very fast. Uh, this score meant that it's uh, very good and a very, um, a very opportunity uh, moment, a very opportunity moment to implement a code of good governance in uh, Romania with the full support of the Ministry of Sport. What I do know for sure is that uh, the academic level, the Faculty of Journalism, will disseminate the knowledge in, in that uh, was gained through this project. Uh, and um, more specifically, um, we use the data as a scientific platform to realize uh, um, master degrees and bachelor's degrees uh, as part of this, uh, of this knowledge. Thank you very much. Florian, it is a tour de force. It is just a five minutes uh, pitch of the uh, individual uh, results. Uh, uh, thank you, Florian. We will uh, not take questions now, but uh, perhaps a very short round of questions afterwards. Uh, Florian represents the University of uh, Bucharest here, and I would also like to thank uh, the Romanian Football Federation, represented by Florian Sadi. Uh, who have been uh, project partners uh, uh, of, uh, throughout these uh, two years and assisted with uh, advice. Um, now it is up to uh, Nina Kutzmann uh, to defend uh, the national honor of uh, Germany after this relative uh, bashing. But now I'm not sure if, uh, if that is your main mission, but at least yeah. we will, uh, you are somehow, you and your colleagues, uh, Tim Miller Scholl could not be with us today, and Jürgen Mittag uh, just left. So you are 
uh, representing. <laughs> Everybody ran away, but uh, but Inya, you you uh, you have the yeah. you have the force. Yeah. Yeah, I try to keep it very short and precise. Um, these are our our um, results. We scored um, only weak with 37 percent. Our best dimension is transparency, and then democracy, internal accountabilities, and societal responsibility. We talk about average scores, and you see in the column the different colors and the percentage um, for our nine, uh, five, yeah, I think nine, nine federations. And we have um, a large variance between the nine federations in comparison. So we have very well done um, federations and worst federations. And there's a large variance between different principles within a dimension for many generations. With regard to transparency, which is a moderate score for the German federations, we have very good principle achieved in the publication of the statutes, internal regulations, and sport rules on the website. These are stable and permanent information, so it's easy to um, publish this information. Moderate and weak principles um, concerning the agendas of minutes of the General Assembly, information about board members and annual reports. So um, there's little awareness of these um, factors that, which are important for good governance. And um, also an argument is limited resources. Um, and not for principles concerning especially board decisions and remuneration. These are sensitive information about personal and financial matters. The federations want to avoid misinterpretation, especially with regard to the board decisions. And on the other hand, um, we have a very hierarchical system and structure in Germany. So on the national level, um, the federations have um, the regional federations as their members. So the stakeholders are not um, directly, or the members are not individuals or local sport organizations, but only um, the regional federations which demand to receive exclusive information and that also comprises um, sensitive information such as board decisions. With regard to democracy, we have an election or clear election procedures of board members and regular board meetings. These are um, formal practical procedures based um, on the statutes and the regulations. Moderate and weak or not fulfilled principles um, concerning the participation of athletes, referees, coaches, volunteers and employees. That's mainly because of little awareness and the difficulty um, to comprise all um, the different interests within the decision-making processes of the federations. And not fulfilled principles concerning um, policy for differentiated board in terms of profits, for example. And term limits, um, there are, or there is a limited number of candidates. And um, therefore, they ask if there is only one candidate, why do we have Establish a nomination committee, and with regard to gender equality policy, there's also little awareness. So they they are in a learning process. I would say um, they um, get more and more aware of these um, of this special aspect. But yeah, right now it's not. <coughs> Internal accountability also a weak um, score. Um, we have a clear um, governance structure for all federations. So on the one hand, there's the management responsible for the organization's operational um, policy with more or less full-time personnel. And on the other hand, the voluntary um, persons or presidents um, within the board, which is the final authority of the organization's budget and um, finances and the control of management. And all federations have a code of conduct and we can say there is awareness, so it's possible to be aware of important things of governance, and it's easy to adapt these um, things. Moderate principle um, is, for example, or are, for example, audit commission and financial control. So we can say that there's a sufficient standard, um, but no more. And we or not fulfill principles um, concerning the conflicts of interest and complaint procedures. And um, I have to stress that there's a large variance between the different federations. So we have federations with very good or even uh, good um, scores for this, for example, and other um, federations um, scored near to zero percentage. And um, with regard to the board, um, we find only hardly self-evaluation resignation procedures and eligibility rules. And that's um, also because of little experience um, with these things. And I think 
Um, this is a further evidence that there is a learning process within the federations and we are happy to communicate with them to stress that there are more aspects um, than only statutes and uh, so formal aspects to publish on the website that are important for good governance. And the last um, dimension concerning societal responsibility, a weak um, dimension, so also a large variance between the different policies. So we have a very good um, anti-doping policy for all federations, good scores um, in this uh, case, because this is a core policy regarding competitive sport. And there's also, or this is also um, a special structure for the German federations that on the national level, the federations um, feel responsible more or less um, on the competitive sport and not that much on sport for all. That's a task of, or the competence of the regional um, federations and that's why we can explain a little that social inclusion sport for all anti-discrimination and things like these are um, more or less moderate or not fulfilled um, yeah, principles. Thank you very much uh, Ninja. Uh, if you are interested in the individual scores of the federations they are in the report. Um, so, nothing is swept under the carpet. Um, and uh, we were so fortunate that thanks to some support from uh, the Council of Europe, it was also uh, possible to uh, have research uh, carried out in uh, Montenegro, um, a country that, that we do not hear so much about uh, on a daily basis. Um, Marko Begovic has been an employee of the sports minister in Montenegro. He's also running a tennis academy and is now uh, living in Sweden as an independent researcher, uh, taking a PhD in the German Sport University uh, Cologne. So that's a, a multinational uh, uh, person uh, that has conducted the research. Uh, thank you, Jens. Not even to start where I born and where I live. I mean, the country change four times the name and the configuration. <laughs> but of course, let's, let's start. before getting to the results, I would like to say that, that the good governance culture is not new in, in, in Montenegro. During the socialist time, there was an evaluation of the governance structure and they find out pretty much all the issues that, that Arno was talking today that, that surround uh, contemporary uh, sport movement. Based on those findings, they introduced the good governance principle within the action plans in, in, in the 80s. It pretty much was uh, related to the, to the term of limits, to lowering the, the power of, of, of certain individuals and, and the group associated with the uh, Communist Party. Uh, those principles were binding and, and the financing of the sport organization pretty much back then dependent on the application of those of those of those principles. Sadly the the, the, the country disintegrated along with the with the socialist self management system and uh, and I think at this stage it's good there was some question regarding the, 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 the system of settings and the, and the, and the legislation. I would say that uh, Montenegro sports setting is, is in, based on the checker categorization is interventionist since the sport is the uh, there is a provision a constitutional provision that recognizes sport is a activity of public uh, of public interest. There is a specific law on sport. Uh, centralized, most of the politics, uh, most of the policies are, are 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 adopted within the competent state authority. Yeah, yes, mentioned Ministry of Sport, but depend on the political agreement. There was a Ministry of Education in charge of sport. There was a Ministry of Culture and, 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 and media in charge of sport. There is a directorate when I work, and now, and hopefully, it's remain like this. It's a Ministry of Sport, and also the system is consolidated. Um, uh, the legislation or the law on sport foresee that uh, Montenegro Olympic Committee's association of all national sport federation. Uh, with having executive uh, power in terms of deciding who can be the member of the of the National Olympic Committee. The, the members are both Olympic and non-Olympic National Federation. Uh, 
most of those law that, that run the, the governmental institution law, public servant law, public administration and anti-corruption law actually stimulate and enable politically exposed person to be in charge of a sport organization. As the confidence, uh, consequence, most of those uh, politicians are in charge of the, of the decision-making bodies within sport federation. <coughs> At the moment, we have the president of Montenegro acting as a as the president of basketball federation, and until recently, we had the ministry of education, which was in charge of directing the, the funds for the sport, was in charge of the handball federation. And not to be surprised, most of the funds went to the handball and to the basketball. <laughs> uh, but this structure really resulted in inability to, to tackle uh, corruption in sport. We, had, uh, we have ongoing cases in chess and wrestling. Chess is really getting uh, international attention since there is a uh, ongoing investigation not only in Montenegro but in, in so Slovenia and, and, and Slovenia, America and, and Bulgaria regarding regarding uh, money laundering. Coming back to the to the score, not surprisingly, transparency and inter internal accountability score scored the most, uh, bearing in mind that the legislation is clear and, and, and there is a mandatory provision that, 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 that drives organization to need to fulfill some of these criteria. Overall score, I would say, is decent. It, it is between uh, Germany and Brazil and small Montenegro. I would say I'm pretty happy. <laughs> Regarding transparency, uh, most of the federation do adopt uh, legislation meaning to the st appropriate status, internal regulation and sporting rule. They are pretty much accessible in most of the cases to the, to the major stakeholders. If it's not on the website, it's, it's, it's through, the, through the emails. But regarding, uh, even though that, for example, annual reports are, are, are compre comprehensive and detailed, they are not they are not accessible to the most stakeholders, including to re including uh, remuneration policy. We, 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 there there is no federation with remuneration policy in place. Internal accountability, uh, yeah, same same like same like uh, with the previous dimension. It's all driven by the by the clear uh, loan sport which uh, which, which direct uh, how the governance structure within sports organization w would look like also the all sports federation do have audit committee or inter audit committee in place uh, some of them have internal some of them have uh, has an external but this is the mandatory, mandatory provision from the from the loan sport uh, but uh, uh, as we stress with the, with the system of sport the, the, the structure or, or the provision doesn't recognize the uh, proper system to fight to fight corruption or to mit mitigate uh, possible conflict of interest or abuse of office. Uh, democratic pr uh, processes, uh, most of federation or all of federation doesn't have a term of limits in, 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 in place. Also, gender policy, gender policy is lacking. Even though that Montenegro did a, a, a recent research, a research on the gender equality, and there was a, some intention for the Montenegro Olympic Committee to really uh, adopt uh, appropriate policy, but so far it, it's 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 missing. And societal responsibility is a is, is a very interesting it's a very interesting dimension. It doesn't look so red as as it's. It's probably up here now because, <laughs> uh, well, it's it, with this pro process that lasts almost two years, we had the opportunity to talk with the different stakeholders, and and you know their their perception is that the, the loopholes from the from from the law sport and the transfer responsibility to some uh, state uh, for some other state uh, institutions. Are really something which they believe that it should be the the other other institution dealing with the, for example, uh, uh, environmental sustainability, gender equality, and discrimination, because there is a there is a for uh, anti-discrimination, gender equality, there is a specific sp specific law and specific uh, state uh, state uh, state ministry that de de dealing with those with, with those questions. To conclude, new developments. Uh, recently, uh, Ministry of Sport adopted new uh, new law on sport. 
it's recognizing the concept of, I would say, semi-depolitization of sport. The prime minister and president will not be able to act as a, as a president of the federation, <laughs> but the politicians on the local level will be will be will be will be available to 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 be in charge. Uh, state exams for sport administrators in order to work and to be to work on a daily basis to operation work as a, as a general secretary or technical secretary or a manager you will need to pass a state uh, state exam it's a, it's a mandatory provision uh, term of reference and scope of action for each each board and standing committee along with the, with the individual position are clearly defined between the law and sport but the most problematic provisions are, are regarding uh, forcing the equal treatment for amateur and professional sport organi organization. That means that the, sport, the professional sport organization, we have them six in Montenegro, will be able to gain uh, legally all the, most of the funds, or most of the funds uh, directed, directed for the sport. So by the loan sport, uh, two professional clubs from each federation will be able to to to, to take a, to take a, to take the funds from the state. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Marco. It's a very interesting to have the historic context. I will personally take a new word with me: semi-depolitization. That's. It will be go. That'll be interesting to throw on the table next time we have a discussion about the so-called autonomy of sport at the international level. Maybe it's not autonomous. Maybe it's just semi depolitized <laughs> Okay. Um, um, Oscar Solnes and uh, uh, Birnir uh, Egelson. Birnir, where are you? There. Um, and uh, Hagia uh, Gamuseta, who has uh, left us this morning, I think, been carrying out, uh, have been our partners in uh, uh, the Molde University College and also the Norwegian uh, Football Federation has uh, at least been there somewhere on the sideline. Um, and um, and uh, as you have all seen now, Norway is king of uh, governance, uh, so you will tell us why. Well, uh, let's hope I'll tell you why. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for uh, letting me present the Norwegian uh, results. Um, uh, in this uh, sample, there are these five uh, uh, federations that are already mentioned. Athletics, football, handball, tennis and swimming. And uh, we also uh, chosen three other uh, federations, so it's the Confederation of Sport and the Olympic Committee in Norway, also the sort of the umbrella organization, has uh, taken part. The Skiing Federation, which is one of the most the biggest and most important, in, especially when it comes to the Norwegian cultural uh, understanding, has taken part. And we have also included uh, the Equestrian Sports Federation, which is a mid size uh, uh, federation, but uh, which is uh, different from the others with a very high percentage of young women and female uh, members. So, um, but I'm not sure whether that was will be shown in the results. So, but to use, this is the Norwegian results. Um, the NSGO index is on 78%. Um, so it's good. It's uh, nearly very good. Um, the transparency is 84%, democratic processes 69 internal accountability and uh, societal responsibility both, both on 80%. So, uh, very high scores. And um, as Arno said, we, uh, even coming from Norway, we were expecting high results, but I think this is uh, even more than we expected. So. Um, um, the the survey that we have conducted is not really giving us any uh, answers to why it is in this way, uh, but other that they are they have all the tools in the toolbox more or less, uh, but it's not we have, uh, it's difficult to, to give a good answer to why. But uh, let's we will uh, we will dig into that as well. What is surprising for us is 
coming from a country defining itself as a very democratic country, it's, uh, it's a bit surprising that the weakest <laughs> dimension is actually the democratic processes uh, within the organization. So that was kind of surprising for us. When we started to look into why it was that way, we were not that surprised. Because uh, there, are, there are two main uh, reasons for that. First of all, uh, in the Norwegian, and I guess we could say even the Scandinavian tradition, there is, uh, you are a member, and as a member you have all the rights. So there are no sort of inclusion of internal stakeholders into, into policy um, uh, development and, and so on. So there are no internal stakeholder representation. And that's, that's an important um, um, to understand the, the sort of low. They still very high, but still lower than the rest. And the other thing is that, uh, as most other countries, there is no term limits uh, when it comes to uh, board representations. So, but uh, we tried to, to uh, say something about what what could it be that explained this uh, uh, relatively high numbers? And I've borrowed uh, I, uh, Roosevelt's uh, famous speech from 1942, Look to Norway. Um, well, there is a question mark there. Um, first of all, when we try, why, why do Norway have such a good uh, NSGO score? Um, I think one of the, or we think, uh, one of these explanations is that this umbrella organization, the Norwegian Confederation of Sport, is very strong and it's a centralized organization um, and all sports federations and all regional organizations have to, they are members in this centralized organization and, and um, the governmental funding which is uh, from the lottery money goes via, via this umbrella organization. So there is a lot of uh, power within this organization. Um, and they have used this power in order to set up uh, common statutes, regulations, etc. So the smaller federations are in a way leaning on on this, uh, the Norwegian Confederation of Sport. So that's at least one explanation. But this could easily also been used in order to explain very bad results because they could also, a strong centralized organization could also uh, sort of destroy good governance. But, um, so there, there, we, there has to be other explanation as well and maybe this is a boring uh, answer but still, uh, sport is a reflection of, sur of the surrounding society and Norway is a very egalitarian society. There is uh, nearly no hierarchy. Uh, there are general laws regulating gender equality, representations and working conditions and so on. So we find that many of these indexes or these principles that we developed in the projects were already implemented one way or the other in uh, the organizational structure of, uh, of the Norwegian Confederation of Sport and, and the rest of these uh, sports federations. Um, on the other hand, um, looking at, for those of you who are following, uh, that's probably not many of you, but still, there is a, a, a debate going on in Norway uh, whether the Norwegian sports organizations are governed in a good way or not. Uh, there's a, a lot of media pressure from uh, some of the biggest newspapers um, and also the government are questioning the way that the sports organizations are governed and especially how they are, are using the public money. So in a way, um, what we think that we see here is that even though you have have the tools and they are there and uh, you still there are still people in the organizations that need to do the job that's one thing uh, and the other thing is that having all these systems for good governance especially when it comes to transparency 
It also gives media and governmental uh, bodies a good opportunity to look into these organizations. And by such, you will have more sort of external debate, which I guess for some of the organizations is seen as problematic, but as, uh, for the society, it's, uh, it's a good thing, I guess. So, uh, yeah, that was very short on, uh, on the Norwegian uh, results. Uh, the more detailed are, are to be found in the report. And we are more than happy to, to share and discuss with those who are interested. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you, Oscar. An interesting, in, in, uh, uh, an interesting observation from Norway that increased transparency does not mean that the debate disappears. And uh, that's also not the intention, actually, of introducing uh, uh, transparency. It's actually to allow more people to understand and, uh, and shape the future of the sports organizations. Um, we, will have, we are short on time, but we'll just, if the, you have brief questions for, for the understanding of this or remarks you heard, no, and then we will just say thank you uh, for uh, giving us this impression of uh, four different country settings as Arnold showed. It is the country rather than the sport that is a decisive factor uh, for, for uh, the governance <laughs> score. And uh, I invite you to take a seat while I will call up uh, uh, the representative of uh, Poland and Brazil and um, uh, just a moment, we have we have it on the screen. And uh, Christos uh, from Cyprus and uh, Frank from uh, the Netherlands. And uh, this is more for a little uh, roundtable uh, type uh, discussion, because one of the interesting things when we started the NSGO was very rapidly, very rapidly, there was actually a big interest from uh, other countries to join in, or uh, from uh, governments in the respective countries to see how could this tool be useful, or from sports organizations, uh, umbrella organizations, and so there, it has not been elaborated, this whole uh, project, in like an isolated, Atmosphere in the ivory towers, uh, but but rather in in a kind of very various dynamic uh, process. I will try to uh, guide you through the uh, this roundtable uh, discussion, and I, I'll just start as uh, as far away as, as we go uh, geographically. Uh, Louis Haas and um, uh, his colleagues uh, who uh, are here, where are you, Louis Philippe and Thiago. Jack was there, and Louis Philippe is there. Yeah, um, uh, they, you, you come from uh, uh, Soto Esporte, and uh, which is uh, uh, Brazilian NGO. It means I am from sport or I am of sport, um, and it has uh, it's an organization that has worked with social projects, but also in recent years uh, worked with uh, sports governance, and also the University of uh, Paraná. The Federal University of Paraná uh, uh, has been uh, backing this. Um, Louise, uh, you have seen some governance changes in uh, recent years in Brazilian sport. Is that a kind of unintentioned legacy of the Olympics? Because the Olympics were so expensive and there was so much uh, corruption around that Action was taken, or what were what has been the, the driving factors? You have the microphone, actually. Uh, well, uh, Jens, thank you very much again for for being part of the project. Uh, you said that will be a easy question, but <laughs> you promised me. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, uh, I don't think that is uh, a planned uh, legacy, but uh, was really part of the process. Uh, and I don't know if intentionally, but the, the research project helped us to 
uh, puts the organization, especially the national federations in Brazil, in the same level of debate that was happening around the world. So uh, we had. We had a corruption case in the National Olympic Committee that it's uh, our umbrella uh, organization that, as in Norway, they uh, distribute the public funding for the national federations. And uh, this corruption case uh, turned uh, public the discussion about sport governance in Brazil. And especially after the Rio 2016, we had uh, big uh, changes in some sport federations, uh, especially in the National Olympic Committee, that are a new uh, statute in a very modern statute now. And also uh, the movement of the athletes that are an organized uh, organization, and they are really creating new legislation new laws that are helping this beginning of the process of changing good gov governance in sport organization. And this organization is called Atletas Pelo Brasil. Yes. Uh, it means Athletes for Brazil. Yep. Uh, and they have had an impact. Can, can you mention uh, two or three specific changes that is made uh, yeah. in, in the sports organization? Yeah, sure. Uh, the first one was uh, to fight uh, for term of limits. Now, Every national federation in Brazil that received public money have to have term limits. It's four years plus four. You cannot be present for more than eight years. And uh, athletes are represented in the General Assembly. Uh, now they are discussing that they have to be one third of the General Assembly. So they are trying to create a new democratic uh, um, ambient. So, but I think that they are other agents as coaches, referees, that must be part of this discussion also, because not athletes have to be uh, listened. We have more agents like clubs, local clubs, that they are not so organized. Uh, and uh, there are questions about transparency of uh, public money uh, in projects that they have to really be very uh, clear to receive this money again. So this, this is part of the change. Uh, if I understand uh, right, during earlier visits to Brazil, all public institutions have to put every expense on the internet yes. with the documentation, every taxi bill, every uh, rest, uh, restaurant bill. Uh, does that go for sports organizations also? Yes, yes. Uh, it's not so <laughs> clear how they are uh, proceeding this, this uh, transparency question. But today, you can find information about public money, how they invest, how much uh, a president uh, use in the high performance athletes, or in national competitions, or international competitions, or to be represented in the International General Assembly of uh, the Sport Federation. So now it's more clear how they use the public money. And these are changes that has happened over the past Few years. Yes, it was, I think, that like the past five years. But the last two years, we have two big changes in the legislation. And uh, it's going uh, for uh, strict uh, questions like uh, like the participation of athletes in, in, in General Assembly. It's a big discussion now in sport ministry if they need to be one third or no. If the, because in Brazil we have like the state federations uh, and they are a political force. They used to, to maintain the power. It's what happened in our football association now. They are not part of this public funding, so they don't uh, are obligated to input this uh, changing, so they are trying to put them in this process also. So. Okay. Thank you, uh, Christos uh, and Anastopoulos. Um, we have uh, seen the results of Cyprus. Um, how has the response been in the sports community when you uh, served them these 
very red colors. Uh, first of all, I'm affiliated with Molde University College in Norway. Can I talk about Norway? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, seriously, uh, there, is a, there is a paradox here. Um, it feels uh, quite uncomfortable uh, representing a country that has been the negative outlier uh, amongst the examining countries. But at the same time, and I took a note here, uh, Arnu emphatically underlined that the prime purpose of this project has been to assist and inspire to raise the quality of governance in sport in that respective country. So there is a paradox here, uh, being uncomfortable, but at the same time, probably, you are looking, proportionally speaking, should we repeat the exercise in three years, the clear winner? Because we cannot make it any worse. <laughs> and uh, this is, I see this, I, I see this very, very positively. There is a positive message behind, and if you heard that there has been some a negative reception, these are, Rumors, journalists. Uh, no, uh, don't don't listen to that. Uh, um, in Cyprus, uh, first of all, uh, there has been great support from from the highest authority in sports, the, the Cyprus Sport Organization. Great leadership. They are determined to 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 change things. As we've seen, uh, there is a there is a great room for doing things better and differently. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, I've done a little bit of more work than the other partners did, because uh, uh, as opposed to Germany, for example, where you, you come across with uh, some results and you are surprised that uh, some scores are, are a little bit lower than you expect, uh, I think uh, there was a general uh, certainty in Cyprus that the results uh, would look like the ones we've seen. So on the back of this project, uh, the Cyprus Sport uh, Organization, as I said, the highest authority in sport in the country, uh, it utilized this particular project to collect data, to see, to be able to demonstrate this picture to all stakeholders, amongst them, chief among them, uh, of course, the national sport federations, and, um, and develop the first ever code for good governance. So, perhaps with a, a top-down approach to, to start making things a little bit differently. So I did not look only at the 5 plus 3 uh, organizations as per the project's instructions. I looked all 32 that had something available there for me to look at. There are 71 active sport federations in the uh, Republic of Cyprus. Out of these 71, 32 had to start for me to start with a, a website. So transparency-wise, you can you can tell uh, that wasn't there for for the majority of them. So I looked all 32. So I I I, I done the, this exercise, this uh, this um, uh, this research for all 32, and uh, the score was a little bit. Different. I think we scored 29% uh, for the 32, whereas 27 for the eight examine. So, with great leadership from Cyprus Sport Organization, we developed the code. And we presented the results plus the final version of the code on the 3rd of June 2018. And uh, there has been given now a kind of uh, grace period for the federations to have a look at their status and perhaps make the necessary changes. And as of uh, January the 1st, 2019, the code uh, is on effect. And uh, in a year's time, at the end of 2019, the Cyprus Sport Organizations will look at these federations and ask the questions, how, how good you are on this and that. And there is a thought that this performance on good governance is linked to the financial support that these federations are receiving from, from the highest authority of the So, so this, this is the picture. So, on one hand, 
quite poor results. On the other hand, a strong motivation for speedy action. Absolutely. I must say that the Cyber Sports Organization has been part of this project from the start. It was part of the application and has also been very active. It's very unusual. They're not part of the meeting. Usually they, they, they would be. Um, uh, Alexandra, I went to the national uh, seminar in Poland and I remember... <laughs> yeah, it, it was very good. <laughs> and, 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 and together with the, your colleague from the Warsaw University, Paweł Sembora, and the Polish uh, Golf Union Secretary General, uh, Bartolomej uh, Czernieczki. Yeah? Um, uh, I remember you, when the day started, you were a little bit nervous because perhaps the sports federations did not come quite voluntarily. Yeah, I was sure that they will come because that was obligatory to come. Uh, I was afraid that they will have no nice spirit because they were forced. But um, what was really amazing during our meeting, I, uh, and I totally appreciate what you've done during the seminar. I mean, Jens, uh, Arno, uh, and also the guy from Norman from the Dutch uh, Handball Federation. So they told us that this that is doable to change sport field. And during the seminar, the atmosphere has changed rapidly. So at the beginning, they, they, they felt that they are here because they have to, because a minister was, our Minister of Sport was, was one of the hosts. And then we started the workshops, and, um, and they felt that we are supporting them, that in this very moment, we start something which are now called uh, supportive policy, because we were asking them very precise question, guys, practically, what you need to know to implement good governance co code of conduct, or what you are missing right now, and we finished with a very practical recommendations. Like for example, if we are a small and very poor federation, we can share cost of lawyer. Very simple. Uh, if our Ministry of Sport is telling us you have uh, half of a year to uh, prepare um, strategy, so that is a nervous situation in Poland because every uh, federation has to very fast pre, uh, prepare a strategy. And they just don't know how to do that. And they ask Ministry to give them the template. Very simple. like. You can help us in a very simple way to do something you require from us. Uh, what was also striking and really elevating me is that they were ready to cooperate, you know, like federations to federations, not only to ministry or something. And I think that they also understood that good governance is not like a slogan or like an idea but it's also bringing us closer to healthy management. Like, uh, if you are doing all this stuff from our um, research or project, um, you can have like a better organization. And I remember the moment when Norman from, uh, from Netherlands showed them something very obvious, like the healthy uh, organization um, triangle, that you should, need, you should have a lot of volunteers then you should have a good uh, empl uh, employees, and then you should have like a small amount of board members. And that was the moment that all these people was like, oh my God, we have everything in reverse style. Like we have a huge board, we have some employees, but not enough, not sufficient, and we have no volunteers. So I think that the very intense moment was not directly about good governance, but about healthy organization. And the second breach I think that they were thinking about was that having a, I have to stress, I know, uh, I feel that from you. That will be the f five last sentence. Uh, the last breach was having a good governance um, embodied in organization is to build a bridge between sport field and society. Because if you have transparency, democracy, you can bring more people who are not you know, directly from the sport uh, world. And we know that we need that. So one guy was really amazed from very small and poor uh, federation. He told me, oh my god, I understand that I'm an amazing person because they brought me from embassy of Poland from some remote country. So he was a diplom diplomat. 
and he, was, he has no links with sport, but this small federation understood that bringing guys from different fields will really support a federation. And he was so proud that he understood during, the, during our workshop that that was an innovation. So the day was brilliant. Thank you, Jens, once again. Well, uh, Alexandra, I have to force you to, to, to speak one more uh, sentence. Uh, the situation now is, as I understood it, the government was ready to introduce a good governance code, not only strategy plan, but good governance code very fast. Mm -hmm. Do you think that through the seminar, the government is now ready to actually have a regular dialogue with the federations before defining the sports governance? Yes, thank you so much for this question because I forgot about one very important point and now I can put it. So. Uh, we need, and that will be my goal for the next three months, uh, to implement this code of conduct of good, of, of good governments, which our ministry is now intensively implementing. We need umbrella organization, and that is my uh, very big plan for Poland, because someone has to animate the constant dialogue. and. Um, uh, to be honest, and sorry because the people from our ministry is here, but it's not like a critique. Normally, when you are talking about requirements, we have the situation of power game. So we have the government who requires you to do something, who it force you, and then the people who has to, you know, do something. And we need another actor in this field to make this ecosystem more friendly. And I was really um, inspired by, by Flemish people, girls, you are somewhere here, because they are from high. So you were talking about, about having umbrella organization in this whole settings, who is doing this power game not so strict. And I think that to really fulfill the requirements of ministry, we need some kind of dialogue entity, and we have to create one, and I will be the head of this. Thank you. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I'm not sure you are. Uh, uh, Frank in uh, uh, Franklin Egeren uh, uh, is, uh, uh, has, was also part of our uh, previous uh, Agis project since a senior consultant at the Utrecht University. And um, you have now had a quite positive benchmarking. In the Netherlands, you have had a good governance code since 2005. That does not beat Montenegro uh, from 79, but you have since 2005. Is that the reason um, that uh, the Dutch Federation performed well? Or is it rather just culture because that old paper from 2005 has, has long been forgotten? Um, well, first of all, it's a matter of interpretation, of course, if the Netherlands scores well. I mean, 60%. Um, well, it depends on your ambition, I guess. Um, Don't be mean, please. Um, I won't be mean to you, uh, to no one, actually. But uh, no, I mean, it's tempting to see and look at the rankings and see, well, you're on the third place, so we could be, you know, uh, satisfied by, by where we are now. Um, and yes, there is some awareness for good governance, definitely. And this has directly to do with this uh, particular uh, sport governance code that was introduced in 2005. Um, but at the same time, I think the main challenge for, for the Dutch sports organization is to keep awake. Uh, do not fall asleep. Uh, do not think, oh, in 2005 we had this code and now we are on the third place, etc., etc. We are all right. Uh, I think this is, uh, would be a big mistake. Uh, the same would probably also be for Norway or Denmark or France, who relatively score well uh, as well. Um, and of course, because there are a few uh, things going on in the Netherlands, for instance, we had some scandals around uh, sexual harassment in, uh, in the last couple of months. Uh, there's also still a big debate around uh, gender equality and other kind of diversity represent, uh, re uh, people represented in the board, for instance. And the thing is, the, I, to me, the most um, striking problem in the Netherlands is that there is no urgency to really change. So yes, uh, on general, on average, it's, it's fine, uh, but to make the next steps, that would be a big challenge. And fortunately, uh, let's say it was a parallel process to our research. Uh, in the Netherlands, there was a, a sports uh, agreement produced, and the sports agreement is a, a document produced not only by sports organizations, but also with government, the national government, but also local governments. But also, for instance, the health sector or the welfare sector, and this is also this whole uh, agreement is meant to um, enforce the, the societal power of sports. 
And this is a kind of thick report, and one of the remarks in the report is that we need renewal of the sport governance code. And particularly because it's, it's a nice code, uh, but the subtitle is Comply or Explain. This means it's our 13 recommendation is in this current code, um, and it's very, very liberal in a way to say, okay, well, term limits, yes, we recommend, uh, but if you don't do it, just explain why you don't do it. I think now we live in a different era uh, where we think differently about these kind of things. Um, so we're now up in the process of renewing this uh, existing uh, sport governance code. Uh, the research is very helpful because uh, it's based on let's say robust information, it, it structures really the, the debate with the sports federations. And for them the main challenge is, or the main question is, are we able to do this renewal ourselves? Or do we need this external pressure? And what we do with the research and also with, for instance, the sports agreement I was just mentioning is that there is a little bit more urgency now to really start changing it. Otherwise, maybe other partners such as the government will step in and they will lose a little bit of their autonomy because then maybe you know there will be requirements that will be mandatory and will be uh, related to the subsidies and the uh, lottery money that will be distributed. So I think in that sense we are creating a little bit more of urgency. Uh, there will be a new committee established soon, hopefully, uh, and then next year, and I'm not sure if we're going to beat uh, Cyprus on this, but also the ambition is to have a new code by the end of next year. Okay. Uh... Thanks to the very, very liberal moderator, we are uh, consuming a good part of your coffee break. Um, uh, and since uh, Frank mentioned that staying awake was uh, <laughs> something very important for Dutch sport, it's also goes in this room. Uh, but I think we should just take, if there are two or three uh, uh, brief questions, we'll take the two or three and we will let the panel come with some uh, brief uh, remarks. more of the coffee time, it seems like everyone wants to go already, but um, um, well, I go from Poland originally as well, so I'm especially interested in that uh, situation, and for me, looking at the state of good governance in Poland now, and governance in sport more generally, it's a bit surprising that there is already a code of conduct for sports organization that is being implemented in a bit of a rush, I would say, at least I have this impression. So I'm wondering about you. Don't you think that that would possibly maybe make more sense to wait a little bit and to rather try to do reforms through actions, and then so wait and then wait then now and do nothing and then no no but, but, but I'm continuing with the question. Uh, try to get to the state when you can actually develop this this code already in cooperation with different stakeholders through uh, through a dialogue. Or do you think and also it's a it's a question for different for other members of the panel. But, or is it better to put the code in place right away and then get to the, to the second phase of actually having a uh, cooperation with the stakeholders? I think it's impossible to stop the process of implementing this governmental code of conduct and to be honest, if we want to mobilize more um, resources and support, it will be done in this, we can say, old way power game style but it's not something really bad because then we can evaluate what happened and start like the second iteration uh, with some like insights from this first phase, which was really, really quick. The pace was too intense. But I think that although it's bad, a very intense pace is always bad, but at the same moment when I was listening to Federation, I think that they were really uh, thinking intensively, so um, we can learn from this uh, this first phase. I don't know if I ask if I answer you, you know, fully, but I think that both way we can mobilize our support and help them right now, or we can wait because we won't do that, and then do the prepare or create the second phase, the second phase or second stage or iteration in the, a little bit different way. But both directions need evaluation, and who can like do that because I think that this umbrella um, idea, my, I, my idea of umbrella uh, organization like they have in Norway or they have in different countries or um, Flemish, that is the organization who can look from the 
um, from the above meta level and give us uh, give us some um, some insights. But without this actor, we can do that. Yes. And uh, Christos, you are very much in a similar situation. Uh, Three months, but I will I will um, try to, to, to connect and, and, and try to answer your your your, your question. Um, I have seen the police code. Actually, I have a copy. Uh, I will not comment on that. Uh, you you express your view. But what happened? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, I, I think I, I was about to say that I share your view uh, that it was done a little bit in a haste fashion. But uh, anyway, uh, so. In the Cyprus case, um, uh, we did go through this consultation process, uh, pretty much utilizing the resources of this particular project. So I personally uh, talked to all federations that I examined. Um, we had focus groups. Uh, we, uh, we had a public uh, debate where all federations were present. To give you an example, the first draft of the code had very much inspired by the, the, the Flanders uh, and the UK's one. We had three tiers, so the smallest federations had to com uh, 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 comply with certain principles. But through this process, uh, we ended up having a, a one uh, package for everything, a little bit more simplistic in inverted commas that it is readable and, 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 and simple to understand because what we experienced sorry is that these people in the federations in the boards need support when it comes to training and understanding the principles so this is what the cybersport organization is doing now providing this kind of support to quite extensively I would say. Uh, Louise, fast legislation and then dialogue is that also the uh, recipe? Yeah, no, well, we are, in Brazil we don't have any code in development now, <coughs> only really uh, change laws. Uh, I don't think that's the best way because they are always forced to change and they are not understanding the concept of the, why they are changing. Uh, that's one of, we will uh, organize our seminar in two weeks and we are lucky that you will be there to present an uh, international view of the, the, the research and to show them that it's more than just obligatory changes or these concepts and need be understood or understood by all the, the, the agents. So I think that's the best way. Um, yeah, I, I think, of course, uh, uh, Making regulations first and then start talking might not be the right way to do it. But on the other way, on the other side, you have to be careful not to uh, only talk. And this is, for instance, something that I am a little bit afraid of in the Netherlands because always, you know, every organization that has to change a little bit, of course, finds tries to find excuses to do something else or not do anything. For instance, in the Netherlands, there's quite some critique or criticism uh, on our uh, research because they say, well, it's only about structural things to change. And this says nothing about culture. In a way, I've, I agree, yes, that's true. But still, is that a reason not to uh, renew the code, for instance, or not to introduce new regulations? So, um, introducing regulations without talking, very bad, but only talking doesn't make sense either. Thank you. The coffee break is over, um, <laughs> the, but, but we will make an extra coffee break uh, uh, starting as of now. Thanks a lot uh, to the panel. Um, and uh, this extra break will be 20 minutes, like the one we cancelled. So we will meet here at 20 to 4. Thanks, uh, yes. Not good, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, I know the top guy, Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Ik had eigenlijk verwacht dat uh, we hadden het met Frank verslag. Ja, ja, ja. ja, ja. ja, ik uh, ja, ik uh,